Welcome to session five of the Identity Series, Walking with Integrity. In the previous session, Todd talked to us about being unified in the body of Christ and how important it is to walk in unity as believers. Right now, we're going to move into walking with integrity, and there's a lot in that. Uh, I've been a youth pastor for a long time, just recently made the transition to being a pastor. But in my youth ministry years, I had the amazing opportunity to serve and work with a lot of great pastors. And one of the pastors that I worked with was a guy named Randy. And Randy took me water skiing for the first time in my life, okay? And so it was a staff retreat. We're at a small church, so it was just he and I. We were the staff. And so we're out on this lake, and we've got this great big boat, and I get stuffed, I mean, crammed into a life jacket, okay? I mean, that thing is about to bust. If it goes, somebody's eye is going to go out, you know what I mean? And so I'm in this little life jacket, I'm strapped in, and we get out on this boat, and um, he wants to go first. I've never skied in my life, I've never been out on a tube, never been out on a lake in a nice big boat, I've never experienced anything like this. So he wants me to drive for him. Now, what he doesn't know is that I have no experience. And because of my pride, I didn't want to say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's going on here. I just kind of watched how he maneuvered the boat, how he worked the boat when we were going out to the lake and, uh, and thought I could just wing it. It looks pretty easy. So he says, all right, you're going to drive me around the lake. I'm going to get behind you. I'm going to ski. He gave me the instruction, the simple instruction of, man, hit the throttle. I tell you to go hit the throttle and go full blast and just get me out of this water. Okay. So I thought, man, I can do that. No problem. So he's back there. I'm waiting for the hand signal. You know, he gives me the thumbs up. I hit the throttle and we start pulling away. And it's this awesome adrenaline rush, right? I mean, just like this total man moment right here. And so I hit the throttle. We're blasting out and, and I see him raise up out of the water on his skis. And it was like, man, it was almost like magic. You know, I'd never seen it before. It was awesome to be able to make that happen. And so at first, I'm really careful. I'm maneuvering around. You know, we're in this little cove area where the, the water is, I mean, it's smooth. It's like, it's like glass out there. And so I'm just kind of going around and, and just having a good time and, you know, pulling around. And I seeing him looks like he's having a good time too. And then I just have this brilliant idea, right? I think I'm going to head out to to open water on the lake. Now the water out there was different than the water here. And so I didn't know that that had an impact on the skier. I just saw it looked like it was choppy out there and it looked like way more fun than what we were doing. And so I head out to open water and man, I start bouncing all over that thing. I mean, I'm going really fast, bouncing and I complete, I'm having so much fun. I forget about Randy on the back end of this thing. It's so loud, I can't hear anything. And so I'm cruising around probably like 15 or 20 minutes and I realize he's not there. I'm just basically pulling a rope with a handle flopping around the water. I have no idea where I left him. I have no idea if I've run over him. I have no idea what's going on. So I stop the boat and I get up and I'm looking around and way off in the distance, I see this ski waving out of the water. And so I pull the boat very carefully way over there. I mean, it was a long ways away. I get over there and Randy gets in the boat and he is not happy. But what Randy realized in that moment was he had sent me off to do something, but did not give me complete instruction. He just assumed that I knew what to do. And a lot of times that's what happens in youth ministry. It's what happens in churches in general, is that we give these teachings, we give these, these charges, we get people excited about going and doing something, but we don't give them the instruction that they need to really make it happen, to make it practical, to make it come alive in their life on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what you see in Ephesians chapter 5 is the beginning process. Paul has built in a lot of teaching, a lot of commands. He said to go do a lot of things. But now we get into the nuts and bolts. We get into the application, the practical action that goes into making this stuff come alive. And so I want to read the first six verses. And here's what it says. Ephesians chapter 5, we'll start... In verse 1, he says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, 
anything like that because they are out of place, but rather thanksgiving ought to come from our hearts, ought to come from our mouths. There should be things that come out of us that reflect the Lord and nothing otherwise. So no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. And so as we walk in this, and, and, and you could title this section, Walk This Way, because literally it's a step-by-step, -step, here are the things that should be absent from the life of a believer. And, and we'll start walking through those simply just one at a time. The first thing you're going to see there is... We walk in love is kind of that, that section here. Is we walk in love. You should, if you know Christ, then you don't live like people who don't. And that's, that's pretty simple. That's something that we've seen throughout every single one of these lessons is that you know, when you don't know Christ, when you don't know the Lord, there's a way that, that you used to be. Right? That's, there's a way that you live in that. But when you know God, when you're walking with Him in intimacy, when you're in the Word, when you're a young man or young woman of prayer, when you are disciplined in the disciplines of God, man, there is a marked difference in your life. And so we don't act like everybody else that doesn't know Him. Our life is significantly different. If I know Jesus, then I don't live like people who don't. I should be completely different. The second thing, and, and this is an incredible teaching right here, he says, run away from sexual immorality and all forms of impurity. And, and listen, this is a struggle for every single person. With, with what we have in the way of social media, with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, you have things like Snapchat. You know, there's, there's this constant exposure to people's lives and this, and this constant temptation to, to put your life out there in the world. And what we're, what we're completely bombarded with all the time are these sexual images and sexual messages. And so the teaching for God's man, the teaching for God's young lady, is to keep ourselves distant from those things. And, and what I see a lot of, it, and I've seen this in my youth ministry years and even now as a pastor, is what we as believers typically try to do is try to take in something and then filter out and put aside what we think is bad and receive what is good. And so we'll, for example, we'll watch a sitcom or we'll listen to a particular kind of music or we'll go watch certain kinds of movies thinking that in our mind we can separate what's not good for us and the stuff that's harmful won't have any effect because, you know what, I've kind of just weeded that out. I'm not going to let that mean anything to me. But the exposure of that, the constant message of those things has an effect on our heart. It has an effect on our mind. And really what the enemy is trying to do, and think this through, okay? If you're living in the state of Oklahoma, and there are other states that really reflect these same statistics, but if you live in the state of Oklahoma, I don't know if you realize this or not, but more than half of the marriages right now in Oklahoma are ending in divorce. There is this incredible attack on the family. And what we learned earlier earlier in Ephesians is that, man, this is a spiritual warfare. This is a spiritual war that we are engaged in in the heavenly realms, the Bible says, meaning that Satan has strategically found ways to attack this world and to attack the people in it because he hates you. He wants no good thing for you. And one of his primary attack points is the family. So anything that he can do to try to destroy the family and to try to destroy you personally, man, that's what he's about. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants no good thing for you. The Bible says he's like a roaring lion seeking people to devour. He has no good intention for you at all. He is completely evil, completely diabolical, evil in a sense that we've never known or could imagine. He absolutely hates you. And so in his attacks, he's going to strategically look at a family, strategically look at an individual and see how he can destroy them. And what we see typically, one of the great venues for that is sexual immorality, getting people to fail sexually. It wasn't but a few years ago that right here in our state, there was a span of about 10 months where we saw nine or 10 full-time youth pastors in the state lose their ministries because of sexual immorality. 
And you see it happening all the time. It's not a rarity anymore. And it's all kinds of sexual immorality. And so what the Bible's teaching us is that we, have, we must, as believers, guard our hearts, guard our minds from the temptation of it, from the opportunity of it, and to do whatever it takes. And, and for example, if, if the struggle is, is pornography, you may have a, a student or a, or a man that struggles with pornography and at the same time has a television in his bedroom. And so the teaching of the Word here is that if I am struggling with these things, if there is something that is bombarding me here, then there is the necessity for me to do whatever it takes to make sure that it does not get a hold of me. So it may be taking the TV out of the room. It may be making these extra steps and measures to guard my heart and my mind. I don't want to park there all day, but that is such a huge attack on us right now. And the Bible teaches us to run away from those things, do away from those things, and any form of that, and the Bible calls that impurity. And so number three, let's move on. Don't say foolish things or make crude jokes. Instead, use your mouth to give thanks. Words are incredibly powerful, and God knows that. And so when He's teaching us not to say foolish things or to make crude jokes or to, to, to do all that stuff, it's, it's not just so that we can walk with Him in the right way, and in a right relationship with Him, but it's also because it affects other people. And more than anything, especially in the teaching here in Ephesians, it's that your speech and what you say and what comes out of your mouth marks the fact that whether you marks the fact that you either know Him or you don't know Him. And we want to make sure as believers we walk in a way where people know us. And then the, the fourth thing is to not be greedy. Man, the world is marked by greed. And it just seems like there is never enough. You see people win a million dollars, they want two million dollars. You see people buying a jet plane, they need two jet planes, you know? And even just even in, in our world, it's just this battle of stuff. If somebody gets an iPhone 4, I want an iPhone 5. If I want an iPhone 5, I want an iPhone 12. You know, we all want more and we all need more. We all want more. And it's easy to be greedy. But what can make somebody different in a huge way is if they've not, if they've not been given to that greed, but if God supernaturally changes their heart and they become generous, they become one who gives, even one who sacrifices. Let's look at verses 7 through 14. Here's what it says. It says, Therefore do not be partners with them. Talking about people who are disobedient, people who are of the world, don't walk like other people. He says, For you once were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is, it is the light that makes everything visible. Visible. And this is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And so we want to call this section walk in holiness. That, that's what this is really talking about. When you, when, you, um, when you boil this all down, it's about walking in holiness. Because number one, because partners with God always walk in the light. People who walk with God are walking in the light. You can't separate the two. If you know Him, then you're learning His ways and you're walking in those ways. You've left darkness and you're walking in light with Him. God is only light. He cannot be in darkness. He only exposes light. He can never be in the dark. Number two, person who walks with God, who walks in holiness, produces goodness, righteousness, and truth. Your very nature is changed. You can go into 2 Peter chapter 1 and you can see in, in what happens in the life of a believer that the first thing is, is add to your faith goodness. And, and so when Jesus comes into your heart, you have this movement from walking in, by your conscience and by walking into the Holy Spirit. There's a transformation there. You're walking according to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. He's changed your nature, so now you're not about yourself and about what you want. You walk in goodness. There's a change in your character. And so people who know God walk in goodness, and they walk in righteousness and truth. The things of God become important to them, and they want to live those things out. That's just a nature change because of the relationship with Jesus Christ. Number three, we're able to discern. As we walk in holiness, we're able to discern or figure out what is pleasing to the Lord. And if you go back to, to Hebrews chapter 4, 
And you walk in verse 12, very familiar verse, talks about how the Word of God is living, it's active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and talks about how it cuts into the heart, cuts into the very core of who we are. The daily disciplined believer who walks in the Word, who makes the Word a priority in their life, sees this supernatural teaching come into play. And so by daily contacting God's Word, the supernatural power of it shows us what's of God and shows us what we need to do to follow it. There is a discerning uh, spirit that comes over the believer by seeing into what God's Word says and wanting to fulfill that. That's a part of walking in holiness, discerning what God wants and walking in that way and being obedient to it. Number four, the believer who walks in holiness exposes the darkness. And by your very nature as light, when you walk into something that's dark, that darkness is exposed. God has made you and I to be lights in this world. This world is, is incredibly, incredibly dark. Let's move on to verses 15 through 17. And if you read through that, and we've got a lot of scripture to cover in this section, and so I'll ask you guys to, to walk through that as you break into your small groups and talk about this in your discussion times. But in verses 15 through 17, we're going to call that section Walk in Caution. And so this is the instruction that God gives us to be very discerning in how we walk in this world. So number one would be to be wise. Uh, one of the things that God's Word teaches us that if we ask God for wisdom, He gives it to us in abundance. And I believe that every, every believer, every single day, ought to have a time in their prayer time where they're asking God for wisdom. And think about this. Every single moment of every single day, you are making decision after decision after decision. You're deciding whether or not you're going to take a shower, and I sure hope you do. You're deciding whether or not you're going to eat breakfast or what you're going to eat for breakfast or you know whether or not you're going to do your homework, whether or not you're going to practice well, whether or not you're going to skip out of this or go to that. I mean, you're making decisions all the time. And what does it look like when you don't walk with God, when you're not seeking God, over all these decisions, you're not asking him for the wisdom to do that. Then you're basically just making it up as you go and then you're left to your own. But the Bible teaches us to be wise in every decision that we make. Ask God for wisdom as he leads us in those things so that we can follow him according to his ways and according to his purpose. Very powerful. Number two, make the most of your time. In James, the Bible teaches us that our life is like a vapor. I recently looked at some statistics that really threw me off a little bit. It took a, basically a 24-hour day and said, this is what teenagers, this is what students do in a 24-hour day. And can you believe it? When you look at the things that, you're, that are in your life, you're incredibly busy. You've got school. You've got extracurricular activities. Some of you have jobs. You're involved in all kinds of things. You're not just on one sports team. You're on like three of them. You've got music that you want to listen to. TV that you want to watch, movies you want to see, you, you know, you got all these things that are bombarding your life. And here's what it boiled down to. In a 24-hour day, you cram in, okay, and this is not without sleep. If we take sleep and put that into equation, if you sleep for five, six, seven hours, if you, you know, you're looking at cramming into what's left of that day, 56 hours of activity. Isn't that incredible? Because of your, you being the multitasking generation, you're able to do homework, listen to music, watch a movie, bake cookies, whatever it is. You're, you have this uncanny ability to do all these things, but you're putting about 56 hours of stuff in about an 18-hour day. And that does not even include anything spiritual. That's not going to church. That's not doing a quiet time. That's not having your time alone with the Lord. And so your lives are incredibly busy. And the Bible says your life is like a vapor, meaning you've got just a little bit of time. It's here and then it's gone. And so the time that you have, it's incredibly important to be wise in how you spend it. And for the believer, all these other things are nice, but what, we, what we've been called to is to walk with God. And so number three, Okay, number three, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. A lot of people, and this is what I've seen over and over again, they make a decision to follow Christ. They surrender their life. They, they, they're all in. But then after that, they never really seek the Lord. They never learn how to grow in God's Word, never learn how to get into God's Word and break it down for themselves. In fact, as I've traveled the country getting to preach in lots of different places, I've asked over and over and over again, sort of, sort of taking a poll, and I'd take a group of students and I would say, how many of you would say that you never, ever read God's Word? 
and I'd have them bow their heads, close their eyes, try to give them a, a moment to where they could be honest and, and not be ashamed. And, and so, and these are church kids, okay? And I'd say, raise your hand and let me know if you hardly ever read God's Word or don't read it at all. And you know, most of the time, and it's rare that I see anything different than this, very rare, but what I see almost all the time is anywhere from 90 to 95 percent of those students, and, and honest truth, adults too, 90 to 95 percent of those people do not read God's Word at all. And then when I flip the question and I say, how many of you would say that you spend time in God's Word every single day, that you hardly ever miss it? In fact, I can't even remember the last time that you missed it. Did you know it's staggering. I don't, I don't think I've ever, regardless of the venue, regardless of the size of the crowd, okay, and we're talking at some points hundreds of students, I've never had to use more than both of my hands to count the number of people who every day spend time consistently in God's Word. And here's going to be the result of that. If you don't know what God's Word says, if you don't know what God expects of you, what He wants you to do, if you're not learning how to walk in holiness, if you're not learning how to walk in His ways and, and to know what God wants from you, you, you're going to fail and you're going to walk foolishly through this world. But when you're connected to God and you're in His Word and you're walking with Him, and this was the admonition of, of, of Paul to the church here is, is I want you to walk with Him. I want you to know Him. I want you to know who you are in Him so that you don't walk foolishly in this life. So number three, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. As you walk with God, He leads you to where He wants you to be walking in His will. Very powerful there. Finally, when you start breaking down, uh, you start in chapter 5, you get into verse 18, and you go all the way through chapter 6 and verse 9, it's going to cover a lot of ground. So really important that you guys spend some time working through that. But there are going to be five things that are pretty crucial to make sure that you highlight in that, okay, that you kind of drill down in. Number one, honor God in your future marriage relationship. Okay, honor God in your future marriage. Remember, I told you that the enemy is constantly attacking and he typically is attacking the family in terrible, terrible ways. And for some of us, if you're like me, I, I didn't know how. I was never taught how to be a husband. I never saw it modeled. In fact, when my wife and I got married, it was the first church wedding that any of my family had ever been to. And so I had not in my life seen the model of what a good husband looked like. And so I'm going to be honest with you. I'll tell you what I did. When, when I knew that Jennifer was, was my wife and I knew that we were going to be married, I began to get in the Word and I literally went and found a concordance and I looked and found every scripture that I could find that talked about husbands in the Bible. And daily I began to work through those scriptures to figure out what a husband was and what a husband looked like, what a husband did. And <clears throat> it was incredible what I learned from God's Word. And if you were to talk to Jennifer, I, I doubt she would say that I'm the perfect husband, but I believe she would tell you that I give an incredible effort to be the kind of husband that God wants me to be because I try to walk in that according to the Word. And it may be the same for you as, as a young lady. You may not live in a, in a household where you get the opportunity to see what a godly wife looks like, but God's Word teaches what that looks like. And so it's important for us as believers, as young men, as young women, to be able to look and see what the Bible says. If you have that role model, you have that in your family, man, what a blessing. And you should thank God for that. But if you don't, you can know that God's Word teaches you how to do that. And that's incredibly important. As, as God moves in the family, I believe He moves in the nation. And so important for you to take that on and, and to make sure you get into that. So number two, children obey and honor your parents. Now, this is an incredibly crucial teaching in God's Word. And I've heard it said before, I didn't come up with this, I heard it said before, that what it doesn't say is for the believer, right, who has parents to honor and obey their Christian parents or their non-Christian parents. It just simply says, obey your parents. And if you look in the Old Testament, the incredible teaching of the Old Testament is this honoring and obeying parents. In fact, in the Old Testament, terrible things 
happen to people who did not honor and did not obey their parents. And so why? Why is that so important that we honor our parents? This is an authority that God has put over you. But now this becomes extremely crucial for, for the believer, for the teenager that is a believer, okay? Because you're gonna find yourselves in a couple of different scenarios. One, you're gonna be in a scenario where some of you have Christian parents, a godly influence, wonderful, amazing, godly people in your lives that are raising you. And so for you to be obedient and, and honor them is, and is an incredible honor, an incredible tribute to who they are and how God has blessed you. And it's just an amazing, sweet time when you can do that. That's what I'm praying for my, for my kids. If you're on the other side of that coin and your parents, maybe great parents, but they just don't know the Lord. Or maybe they're parents that, um, that just have, they're, they're, they're walking in brokenness like, like my parents. You know, my mom in and out of my life, alcoholic, drug addict, my dad never even a part of my life. Maybe you come from something like that. For you to walk and honor them and respect them is so powerful because you get to be the presence of God in that relationship and they get to see how you're different and they see how God interacts with you and what we pray is that God would intervene through that and see them come to the Lord by it. So respecting and honoring your parents is an incredibly powerful, powerful thing and that was difficult for me but here's what I got to see. My mom throughout my life got to see what God was doing and at the age of 39 years old my mom called me up asked to go to church with me. She knew I was a youth pastor and knew that I went to church every Sunday. And she called and asked to go to church with me. And you gotta understand, because of the drama that I came from in my family, I had no idea if she was really gonna be there when I went to pick her up, but she was. And I'll never forget taking her to church that day. And at the end of that church service, I was standing at the front. And when the piano player started to play, we started that invitation. My mom walked right past me, walked to my pastor, and called, he, called, he called a little old lady up front, and, and I'll never forget hearing that little old lady lead my mom to Jesus. And to hear my mom repent of her sins and ask Jesus into her heart was so beautiful and so powerful. I had no idea that 11 months later, 11 months later, my mom would go to be with the Lord. And in those 11 months, it was such a miracle. She never drank during that 11 months. She never took an, an illegal drug during that time. And God repaired and mended our relationship. And, and, and in, the, in the midst of all that, the confidence that I had was that in my life, as I walked with God, she saw that and she knew where to run as God was dealing in her heart. And because of our relationship in that, because of what she saw in the way that I honored her and the way that even I was obedient to her, even when it was tough, God used that, I believe, to help bring her to the Lord. Such a powerful, powerful time. Incredibly important to honor and obey your parents. Number three, uh, this is written not necessarily towards you, but it's, uh, it's an admonition for when you grow up and you get to be parents. It says, parents, don't stir up anger in your children. And the teaching there is simply that you're, you're, you're not controlling your child with anger and you're not pushing them towards anger. That's the teaching of the word there. And so it's the idea of making sure that you understand what it means to be a godly parent through his word and chasing after that and modeling that for your kids. And number four, to serve others with a good attitude as if you were serving God and not man. And that's incredible. I mean, as students, you know, there's this preconceived notion that uh, you play all the time, that you're always at camps and retreats and that the church is always giving to you. But what is amazing is that you have an opportunity to be a servant in your church, that you have an opportunity to show off service and to do it with an attitude that reflects the Lord. And listen, some of the stuff, you know, in, in youth ministry, it seemed like we were always cleaning up somebody's mess or we were always serving dinners or we were always doing the grunt work that nobody else could do or wanted to do. And when I saw students do it with a, with a happy heart, with a joyful heart, Man, people noticed that like crazy and what a testimony it was for them. But I've also had students who did that and the attitude of their heart reflected on their faces. They didn't want to do it, didn't want to be there. They just trudged through it, very noticeable, didn't honor the Lord at all. Number five, and we close with this, treat those under, that, treat those under your authority with respect. Treat those under your authority with respect. As you walk with God and as you um, are given the opportunity to be leaders in your ministry, 
God's going to use you in, in incredible ways. And, and there's going to be people that you get to be authorities over, and then you're, there's certainly people that you're going to be under their authority. And in all of that, God calls you as a believer to be respectful and to honor them in that because it's a testimony of who He is in you. And so always guard that in your heart. It's been awesome. Thank you.